Good yes. evening. Good evening, honorable guests, researchers, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to Professor Brian. It is my pleasure to be an MC of the Zoom webinar. I am Yawalak Jitakot, Research and Evaluation Manager from CMEO STEM Ed. Before starting, I have a few housekeeping for the participants who will join us. Let me share the slide. Okay, so I think uh, this is the introduction to Zoom webinar that we will use for today. So I just would like to recommend you to change the name to the country underscore the first name. It will be easy for us to know that where you come from. So if you would like to change your name, you can go to the, to, to the Zoom webinar. And also, all the participants will be assigned as the attendee for this, for this webinar. And also, I would like to recommend you to use the chat box in case that you need some assistance from our organizing team. However, during for the lecture, you can use question and answer box to ask for the question to the professor. To the professor. And also, we will allow you to, to have Q&A box and also I think the professor will be answer your question to the question and answer box. And also we have the other function, it is press hand function. So in case that you have any question during the Q&A session, you can use the right hand function that on the lower left hand side of the screen. And also we have another function, it is pull. This is pull, so you can pull, you can use it after the seminar because we just would like you to do the evaluation for the webinar as well. So this is the introduction to the Zoom webinars for the one who just starting for the Zoom webinar. And also for today's program, we will start with welcome remark by Dr. Kesla Amon Wittibon, Program Director of CMEO Semet. And after that, we will have partnership of Chevron CMEO for Capacity Building Regional Researchers by Ms. Chalida Nalong Sirikun, Manager of Chevron Enjoy Side Project, Chevron Thailand Exploration and Production Limited, Company, Company Limited. And also we will have photo shots for three shots. The first one, it will be organization collaborations. It means like organizer and co-organizer of this, this event. And after that, we have honorable guests, photo shots, and after that it is participant. And then it is lectures about lecture one, some logical underpinning of program effectiveness research by Professor Dr. Bayan. And after that it is webinar evaluations. So first of all, I would like to invite Dr. Kesala Amon Wutibon, Program Director of CMEO STEMET to provide uh, opening remark. Professor Brian Rowan, Professor Tom Cochran, Kun Chalida from Chevron, Thailand, and distinguished scholars from the region and internationally. On behalf of Simeo Semet, uh, uh, I would like to uh, express uh, our sincere appreciation for Professor Brian Rowan who has dedicated his time in the planning and preparing for this lecture series aimed at uh, introducing us to rigorous program effectiveness research in education. I would like to also thank Chevron uh, Corporation for their continued support in advocating the use of evidence to strengthen STEM education. Moreover, support from CMEO Center Policy Research Network, CPRN, led by CMEO Lexam. Our partners, which include uh, Teachers Council of Thailand and Thailand Education Dean's Council, uh, has been highly appreciated. In the recently released the Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metric, or CPLM uh, 2019 report, the findings show alarming trends in equalities 
and poor learning outcomes across six participating countries. Up to one out of three children in grade five read and write, as well as do mathematics. Only at the level expected in the early years of primary education, the CPLM program proposed that Southeast Asian countries and their allies continue to work together on implementing equity learning strategies, measuring learning outcomes, using data, and exchanging on policies and practices. As a result, the CMO summit uh, has developed the fifth strategies to advocate evidence-based policy and build political commitment using what works in STEM education. It aims to provide educators uh, and policymakers in Southeast Asia with evidence of the effectiveness of various program and curricula uh, in literacy, mathematics, and yes, uh, in science as well. So uh, why evidence? The healthcare sector has made a marked progress in using evidence when regulating medicines and treatments. Uh, during the pandemic, many of us uh, might have observed that the research term uh, such as randomized controlled trials, uh, this term has popped up in the news, right? It has been widely uh, used to assure us about the effectiveness of the vaccine and the treatment which could be adopted. Effective use of data and evidence by government leaders to fight the coronavirus in the Southeast Asian region has led to the low percentage of the infected and mortal case, as well as the higher percentage of the survivors. So the evidence-based culture supporting the policy and practices in this healthcare sector is worth exploring uh, on how it can be replicated uh, and apply to improve education in our region. In the next 19 months, the center in collaboration with CPRN and with support from the Chevron Corporation will conduct workshops for regional researchers to improve the quality of research in the region and to increase the number of studies conducted in critical areas like teacher professional development, leadership, and early literacy. It also will uh, offer grants to support research and encourage researchers to study the topics of greater interest to the policy community. So uh, finally, we, the center uh, and the partners, uh, we look forward to working with you in advocating evidence to fight against learning poverty for the betterment of young people in our region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kesla. So next, I would like to invite Ms. Chalidan Nalong Sirikun, Manager, Chevron and Joyside Project, to provide a speech about partnership of Chevron and CMEO for capacity building regional researcher. Ms. Chalida, please. Good morning and good evening, wherever you are, to all participants and Dr. Brian Rowan and all honorable partners. Okay, please allow me to introduce myself. Um, my name is Shalida Narong Sirikun, uh, representing Chevron Thailand as the project manager of the Chevron Enjoy Sign project. Um, first and foremost, uh, on behalf of Chevron, special thank you to Dr. Ro um, Rowan for your time and contribution with um, today's lecture series and for supporting the project's research work. Um, this lecture series you are about to conduct will be valuable to all the educators and researchers who are here with us today. And they will surely make a difference in advancing um, the quality of education research in the region. Also my deep appreciation to all our distinguished partners, Simio Stemet, Simio Rexam, 
CMO CPRN, the Teacher Council of, of Thailand, and Thailand Education Dean Council, who together have made today's event possible. Um, I am also delighted to see so many educators and researchers taking interest and joining us today. Um, thank you very much for your time and enthusiasm. I think many of us here um, may have heard of Chevron. Um, we are a global energy company with operation in numerous countries, including countries in Southeast Asia like Thailand here, the Philippines and Myanmar. And now you may wonder why would an energy company like Chevron care so much about education? And why would Chevron support education research capacity building programs? The fact is um, Chevron has been socially investing in education for many decades because um, we truly believe that um, education is um, foundational to our business success. And STEM education in particular is crucial for developing the STEM talent we rely on to operate our business. For those who are unfamiliar with the Chevron Enjoy Science Project, it is one of the largest social investment programs for education by Chevron in this region. The project was initiated in 2015. Our mission is to enhance the quality of STEM education in Thailand. I must say that um, we are very fortunate to have Simil STEM Ed as our key project implementing partner. Um, one of the project imperatives is to support capacity building of STEM educators and researchers who we believe will play critical roles in reinforcing effective education development in this region. And we hope that um, through the support of our project and our distinguished partners, the lecture series today and the upcoming sessions will complement and enrich your research work and your mission as educator. Going forward, um, education will continue to be Chevron priority as it has always been. Chevron will continue to support a quality education for Southeast Asia. Okay, once again, thank you for your participation and I wish everyone a productive session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kun Chalida. So the next part, it is the photo sessions. So I just would like to make sure that uh, you put the camera properly and also turn on your camera for this. So we will have three photo shots. The first one, which is about um, co organization collaboration that have CMO STEM at CMO Rexam. CPRN representative, the Teacher Council of Thailand, Thai Council of Dean of Education and Chevron. So uh, could you please turn on your camera and we will take a photo. So I will start to count. So we wait for Professor Tom first. So, me, so maybe we, he will prepare his hand. Okay, Professor Tom, I start to count. Okay. Okay, so three, two, one, smile. Okay, thank you for the first shot. The second shot, it is honorable guests from, from many countries. We have 26 country register for here. So we will pin the representative from each country that, that is our honorable guest. So just if you please turn on your camera and also we can take a photo. Ready? Okay. So I will count now, three, two, one, smile. Okay, the last chart, it is for participant. So as we have a lot of participants, 
So we will take only one shot, but have many cameramen. Okay, just turn on your camera and also I will count again. Are you ready? Three, two, and one. Smart. Let, uh, let us check the photo first. This is okay for the team. Okay, so they said one more shot. Okay. Some people just know that how to turn on the camera. Okay, I will start to count again. Three, two, one, smile. Okay, thank you. And we will start for the lecture right now. So I will invite Professor Dr. Brian Loven from University of Michigan. So the, the floor is for Dr. Brian. And thank you very much. Um, just let me do a few things here just to make sure I can view everything I need to view. Good, I think you can now see this, my screen. Um, first of all, good evening, everyone, <clears throat> or good morning, if you're like me in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and thank you for attending this uh, lecture series on program effectiveness research. I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the lecture series itself. And uh, then I will launch into the first lecture of the lecture series. <clears throat> you will notice that the series is entitled An Introduction to Program Effectiveness Research. And there's a reason for that. I do not plan in this lecture series to discuss any topic in detail. And I plan to discuss many topics. And that's a recipe for not exactly learning deeply about any one thing. If you wish to learn deeply, I think that you will have to engage in additional study. However, the lecture series does have a goal, which is to point you to areas where deeper study might be needed especially if you want to develop your skills as a researcher in the area, or if you wish to become a much more sophisticated consumer uh, of research. So this is an introduction. It's a broad introduction. It's meant to cover important topics in the field and point you to areas where you might wish to engage in deeper learning. I've structured the uh, lecture series around four topics. You can see them listed there on the left-hand portion of my slide. Today, I'm going to talk about the logical underpinnings of program effectiveness research. I'm gonna talk about what this form of research is trying to accomplish, how it differs from but contributes to other kinds of research in the field. And I'm going to talk about the central commitments that program effectiveness researchers have about how to do research. <clears throat> Pardon me. In the second lecture, I'm gonna describe several kinds of research designs that people use in conducting program effectiveness research. This will include the concepts of different kinds of experiments and quasi-experiments. And I will discuss briefly the strengths and weaknesses of these various designs. In the third lecture, I'm going to talk about how to estimate and interpret various kinds of program treatment effects that get reported in rigorous program effectiveness studies. And uh, this will include the average treatment effect or intent to treat effect and the effects of treatment on treated. It, it can be bewildering and it is worth therefore talking about just what kind of effect is being estimated and reported when one reads about the results 
of rigorous program effectiveness research. <clears throat> and the final uh, lecture is about how to report on program effectiveness studies, or if you do not intend on conducting and reporting them, what you should expect to be reading in such a report, especially the how to report or interpret the, the, a report with respect to the quality of the research design and how the research process coped with various threats to what are known as internal and external validity that can arise in a program effectiveness study. So that's about the lecture series. Um, at the end of each lecture, I plan on pointing the attendees to some key academic papers that uh, develop various points made in the lecture. So at the end of every lecture series of slides, I have a very small reference list that I think provides uh, some key and or provocative readings that you can engage in. These are academic readings. Some of them for some people will be tough. They're all in English but um, it's at least an effort to direct you to where you can begin uh, your quest for deeper learning. If you wish a comprehensive source for deeper learning and are willing to expend the money, there is an excellent textbook that covers much of the uh, ground that I am covering in this lecture series, but in more detail and with extensive references. That is the book by Shadish, Cook, and Campbell called Experimental and Quasi-Experimental Designs for Causal Inference. I find that to be a very good uh, textbook. It's a source I go back to time and again, and I recommend it for those who uh, plan to engage in this kind of research, or even if you're up for deeper learning, uh, you know, and are a consumer of research, it's probably a good source for understanding the terms you might encounter as you encounter program effectiveness research. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the format of this uh, lecture series because it is virtual. And uh, by virtue of it being virtual, it is necessarily going to limit audience participation. So the way I plan to do this is that at specific points in a given lecture, I'm going to stop and open the floor for questions. Now the slide says via the Zoom, Zoom chat function, please use the Zoom Q&A function for this purpose. And if you want to address a question to me, hold it, uh, or you can write it into the Q&A. The Q&A can accumulate over time. I will address all questions to me in the Q&A box at a point within the lecture. I, I will not be calling on people live. I'll be using the Q&A box to answer questions. I won't be answering questions as the lecture goes along only at the break point. Otherwise, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you to hold your comments to all in the chat function until the lecture is finished, uh, at which point I think audience members can see and see your thoughts. One problem with the chat box for me is that the chats pop up on my screen and uh, it makes me difficult to see what I'm doing. So I, I am keen to answer your questions. And today, I think, uh, uh, let me just discuss, uh, well, let me discuss today in this context. So today, I'm going to spend about an hour uh, introducing you to the logical underpinnings of uh, program effectiveness research. At that point, I'm going to stop and address questions in the Q&A box. And it could well be, given the time uh, that we uh, have expended to this point, that the, we will be uh, at or very near uh, the deadline for ending 
uh, this lecture tonight. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> should there be some time left over, I have a coda to the main portion of the lecture, uh, which if time permits, I will give, if time does not permit for the coda, I can briefly signal to you what that coda is about. And because the PowerPoints that I am using here will be distributed to you, you can uh, read them. Because much of what I am doing, as you will see, because of the fact that I am lecturing in English and it is for many of you not your native language, I will be mostly uh, reading my PowerPoints to you. And so you won't miss much if I don't read those PowerPoints to you directly, except perhaps the opportunity to uh, ask questions. So we'll play the timing by ear, but for now I'm about to spend roughly an hour talking to you about the logical underpinnings of program effectiveness research. So I have certain goals for today's lecture. First, I want to help you understand the role of program effectiveness research within three particular communities, the academic community, the practice community, and the policy community. So I wanna talk about how program effectiveness research interacts with and contributes to those communities. Then I want to try to communicate to you some of the important, what I'm calling key shifts in orientation that characterize program effectiveness research. These are commitments that program researchers often bring to their research that structure how they go about doing their research. And finally, I'm going to spend some time helping you understand what the implications of these key shifts are for the kinds of research that gets conducted on program effectiveness. So again, I'm going to spend about an hour, then I'm going to break for questions, and then time permitting, I have a little coda in which I'll discuss how the logical underpinnings of program effectiveness research shape pilot studies, gate, what I'm calling pilot studies, gateway studies, and larger impact studies. Hopefully we will have time for that, but perhaps not. So with that uh, as background, let's begin by discussing the role of program effectiveness research within the academic, the practice, and the policy communities in the field of education. First of all, let's begin with a definition. What is program effectiveness research? Well, I'm sure that there could be many definitions, but as I define it in this lecture series, program effectiveness research is research that contributes to the design, development, and evaluation of efforts to change policy or practice in real world settings. It's not a laboratory science. It's not a basic science. It's about making change in the real world, designing it and evaluating it. And it involves two different kinds of interrelated research. One is research that works to design and develop new interventions or new policies. And a second is research that evaluates existing interventions or policies. Now, most people think of program effectiveness research as a form of applied research. I'm sure you've heard the distinction between basic and applied research. And, you know, program effectiveness research obtains this label of being applied because of its emphasis on either creating or evaluating interventions that are trying to solve existing problems of policy and practice. But what I want to do today is emphasize that this focus on practical problem solving does not need to be disconnected from an interest in conducting basic or theory-driven research. 
In fact, as I am going to discuss today, program effectiveness studies often draw on disciplinary or education theories as the basis for designing interventions, and they often contribute to education or discipline, disciplinary theory by probing the confirmation status of theories. So well done program effectiveness studies can actually make contributions both to general scientific theory and the, it can do that while maintaining close interactions with developments in policy and practice. So in short, high quality program research is generally conducted in what Donald Stokes famously called Pasteur's Quadrant. So let me uh, consider an example of uh, program effectiveness research from the field of education. Today, I'm gonna focus on research on professional learning communities, not in any detail, but it will be my case of a research topic that is often studied both uh, by basic researchers, by uh, uh, program effectiveness researchers, and it's something that is of keen interest in practice. And I'm assuming most of you know what I mean by a professional learning community, a group of teachers or a group of educators who are meeting together uh, to resolve problems of practice and apply their resolutions in practice. So if we think about this field and this topic, we can see, first of all, that several efforts have been made to develop abstract theories of professional learning community by academic researchers. And these are efforts that have arisen either in the study of the professions or in organizational theory or in theories of um, organizational learning. And the thing about many of these efforts is that they were not developed with any practical problem in mind. They were instead developed just to better understand empirical regularities in the world, how organizations work, how professions are organized, um, how organizations adopt to changing circumstances. So if you are in the academic community, you are often very interested in pure basic research because one of your goals is to build abstract theories that explain how the natural world works. And you do research and your research is valued because it's, it contributes to this enterprise. It evaluates the confirmation status of these abstract theories. But it, your research is not necessarily motivated by its relevance to policy or practice. Now, that kind of pure basic research is often contrasted with practical applied research. And these are like efforts by people in the field to implement PLCs in their own contexts. So there are many schools out there that have formed their own professional learning communities and are trying to make those PLCs work. But in contrast to basic research, many of these efforts aren't grounded in scientific theory. They are grounded rather in professional values about who should have power and make decisions in schools. Or sometimes they're based purely on emulation. That is, well, we have colleagues who are doing it and they like it and we should do it too, or this is being done in a successful setting and we should do it. The point is that there are many people who aim to resolve an existing problem of policy or practice that they face. And they engage in informal research. They don't do this in a silly way. They're often quite thoughtful in their efforts. They, they do things and then they observe the consequences. But their efforts are not about testing abstract theories. They're attempting simply to resolve practical problems in their own context. Now, what is interesting about program effectiveness research is it sits somewhere between these two uh, ways of going about building knowledge. As the figure here shows, it's a form of what 
Donald Stokes called use-inspired research. And as the arrows in this figure show, it benefits both from developments in the practical world, practical applied research, and developments in the pure basic research field. So many use-inspired studies of professional learning communities will look at the professional learning communities observed in real world schools, but they'll do so, they'll reframe the problem as a problem of theory drawn from basic research, and they'll see particular programs and practices as instances of some more general phenomena. Other use-inspired theories will draw on a general theoretical hypotheses to speculate about the consequences of PLCs for teachers or for student outcomes. So these are hypotheses that link professional learning community structures to predicted outcomes. Interventionists and policymakers will often use these theoretical ideas as the basis for developing concrete policies or interventions that seek to promote strong professional communities in schools. And others will evaluate concrete efforts of existing programs that are being implemented in order to understand which programs work and which programs don't. So the point is that use-inspired research, which is what I think many people in the program effectiveness field are trying to do, aspire to do, is drawing on and trying to directly contribute to the improvement of program or practice, while at the same time drawing on theory and academic research and attempting to improve those larger theories. So it's an interesting version of uh, research that warrants its own treatment. Now, what's interesting is because this uh, field of research sits in the position that it does somewhere between basic and pure applied, the researchers who work in this field have developed some particular orientations to program effectiveness research. Now, I can't say that every researcher who claims to be a program effectiveness researcher subscribes to every element of what I'm about to say, but as a kind of ideal type, uh, I think that, that what I'm about to say describes the, the zeitgeist or general philosophy guiding program effectiveness research. So, there are what I think of as three crucial commitments in this field about how to conduct research. The first is people in this field are trying to move away from studying naturally occurring variation in phenomena to studying deliberate efforts to make change in the real world. Second, they're trying to translate abstract theories drawn from pure basic research about phenomena into concrete logic models about how deliberate change efforts actually work. And the third commitment is they're trying to move away from associationist forms of statistical reasoning, A is related to B, to a causal analysis, A causes B to occur. And these are really fundamental shifts. Uh, and uh, it's very important to understand the, the logic of program effectiveness research and the commitments, because it will help you understand what it is that people in this field value when they look at research. And it will help you interpret the many often unspoken commitments that program effectiveness researchers bring to their work. So what I wanna do now is discuss these commitments briefly, and then I'm gonna spend a lot of time on the last two commitments, the logic model and the causal analysis. So let's move from studying, the, the commitment to move from studying natural variation to studying interventions into the real world. Now, a lot of social science research investigates whether some condition A 
is statistically related to some other condition B. For those of you who have had the basic statistics courses, you'll know that that is usually done through correlation or regression analysis. But the interesting thing is that simply finding a statistical association between A and B might not have actionable implications for those who want to change the real world. And so we're going to spend some time on this now. Suppose, for example, that we use correlational evidence, the relation between A and B, to argue that manipulating A will improve B. What I'm going to do now is show you several reasons why we might want more than a simple correlation between A and B as the basis for our practical action. One problem well known in correlational studies is the problem of spurious correlation. So one problem in using a correlation as a basis of action is that a correlation of A and B in observed in some data might be spurious. The term spurious means this, there's some third variable, let's just call it C, that moves A and B in the same direction, such that it's a change in C that accounts for the correlation of A to B. So, in the spurious correlation framework, A is not causing B. There is some third variable C, which is causing both A and B to move together. And manipulating A doesn't change B. It's only changes in C that's changing both A and B. It's a subtle point, but it's an important point, And it's one that we're going to come back with again in this lecture. A second problem in uh, looking at correlations is that while A and B are correlated and we may think of A as a cause of B, it's very possible that B is a cause of A. So that's the causal ordering problem. Which of the two correlated variables is actually exercising a cause? A third problem with correlations is that sometimes A could in fact be a cause of B, but there's nothing we can do to manipulate A. There's no intervention we can make on A. And so those problems are generally put aside by people interested in practical action. There's little we can do about that. Let's figure out things we can change and work on those. And finally, a problem with a correlation among variables is that A might truly cause B, and A might actually be subject to manipulation. But the simple finding of a correlation between A and B doesn't really tell us the steps we need to take to change A so that it produces B. So now let, let me just work you through how some of those problems that I just discussed of correlations arise in existing research on professional learning communities in schools. Several studies have, been, have found a correlation between strong professional learning communities and student achievement. If you read literature reviews of the research on professional learning community and its quote effects on student achievement, what you will find is a handful of correlational studies, regression analysis correlation, that find this relationship. It's a statistical relationship. But these correlational studies have all of the problems of correlational studies. So it could be, for example, that higher levels of achievement in the school are actually producing stronger PLCs. There's a causal ordering issue. This could occur, for example, if, if teachers who had positive outcomes were more likely to share their technical ideas with coworkers and learn from each other, while those who were producing lower outcomes were much more secretive and much less willing to share their ideas. So one can easily imagine a situation in which I'm a very good teacher and I'm happy to share my practices, 
and I'm a very bad teacher and I'm unhappy and not willing to share my practices. In this case, we have a reverse causal ordering. It's the achievement level of the students that's causing the professional learning community and not, and not vice versa. Alternatively, that correlation that has been found in research among strong professional learning communities and student achievement could be spurious in form. For example, it could be that schools with strong PLCs and higher achievement just have better teachers. In this case, it could be that it's the better teachers that's causing both stronger PLCs and higher achievement. There's a spurious correlation. And finally, knowing that strong PLCs are correlated with higher achievement doesn't actually tell us how to create a strong professional learning community in schools that don't have them. Nor does knowing what explicit features of professional community or learning communities promote higher achievement tell us exactly the steps we would need to take to create these professional learning communities or these features of a professional learning community. What it tells us is they're correlated, but it doesn't tell us how to produce the feature itself. So what more is needed to make existing research, correlational research on professional learning communities actionable? I think two things are needed, and these are the things that motivate program effectiveness researchers. One is we need better evidence that PLCs actually have a causal impact on achievement. We need to solve the spurious correlation problem. And second, we need a better theory of how to actually intervene in schools to make PLCs strong if we think they have a causal effect. So this problem of correlational research, which is pervasive across the social sciences and for that matter in education research, leads to two additional commitments by program effectiveness researchers. One is in order to translate that correlational data about statistical relationships among variables into a theory of how to intervene in real world settings, we need to build theories about how to manipulate A to produce a valued outcome B. And program effectiveness researchers do this by formulating what is widely called a logic model for intervention, which this logic model will describe the concrete steps involved in manipulating A and how that manipulation produces certain intermediate conditions that produce valued outcomes B. So we have gone from thinking about a correlation among things observed in the real world to thinking about and building a theory of how to change the real world. And that theory we're going to call a logic model for intervention. And second, if we're going to begin to build interventions and check whether our theory actually works, we're going to need something more trustworthy than a correlation to assess whether or not manipulating A actually affects a change in B. And program effectiveness researchers, and indeed uh, researchers in all kinds of fields, including the health uh, care field, have done this by adopting a much better framework for causal inference than associationist thinking. And that framework has been has come to be known as the potential outcomes framework for causal analysis. It's a very, very important logical framework for, practic for practical or use-inspired research worldwide. And so I'll spend some time today talking about that. So let's begin by talking about a logic model. I just argued that what we need is not to observe correlations, but develop theories of how we intervene. And I argued that our theories are logic models. So in my experience, almost every program effectiveness researcher begins their work with a program by asking the program, what's their logic model? 
What is their logic model? A logic model describes the outcomes the program seeks to achieve. In education, that is often higher student achievement in some academic domain. The logic model describes the structures, the processes, and the activities that must be present in the learning environment to achieve those outcomes. In our example, that would be the features of professional learning communities and their intermediate consequences for teachers that must be present if we're going to produce better learning in some academic domain. And finally, it describes the ways developers can work with adopters to put those structures, processes, and activities in place locally. So you, you, if you go to the internet, just type logic model into Google and push the search button, you'll find there's a huge literature on logic models for intervention, for program design, for program evaluation. <clears throat> and the usual depiction of that model is the one I'm showing you here on the screen. You define the program inputs, what resources and activities are used to make a change. You define the intermediate outputs you expect to arise as a result of using those program outputs, that is the structures, the activities, the processes that result from these inputs. And then you describe the desired program outputs or the, the outcomes that you expect. And note that there are little arrows between uh, these boxes. They are uh, showing you that you are hypothesizing that one feature causes another feature. So in my own work on school interventions, I tend to adopt a somewhat different terminology. And, I, and, and so I wanna, I wanna give you my, it's, 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 it's very much like the logic model you just thought, just different words, uh, but I think it fits better and I'm more comfortable using that language. So I'm gonna tell you my labels for the boxes you just saw. I like to think of a logic model as having three components. The first is what I call the service delivery model. This describes, again, the resources and action steps that program providers are going to use to make change in schools. That's the inputs box in the usual thing, but I'm going to call it the service delivery model. It defines the services that the providers are going to provide to make change. Then I have a, a box that I call the implementation model. And that describes the kinds of organizational structures and processes and activities that are expected to result in schools as a result of exposure to the service delivery model and that are in turn expected to produce impact on the outcomes of the participating units, the treated units. And finally, I have an outcomes model and that in the education field, the final outcomes are often uh, student outcomes. And we want to define very clearly what those outcomes are that are expected to result from the implementation model. So if we were, for example, mounting a professional learning community change, our service delivery model would describe precisely what resources and services we are going to provide to schools to change the professional learning communities inside of those schools and the teaching practices. We would have an implementation model in which we said, this is what we think strong professional learning communities look like. And these are the kinds of professional learning communities we're gonna build. They are going to have particular structures and particular processes going on. And as a result of teachers participating in them, in those structures and using those processes, we will expect certain teacher activities in the classroom. Classrooms will look like this. And in turn, that will lead to certain learning outcomes in a particular academic domain. So you get the idea. We go from service delivery to implementation to outcomes. Now, you can ask, 
what are the features of a good logic model? And my argument is that what's happening in a logic model is it moves from abstraction to concreteness or specificity. So many people talk about a strong professional learning community. But what steps specifically and concretely would a program provider need to take in schools to produce that kind of learning community? And by the way, what does it mean to say a professional learning community is strong anyway? What specific structures and processes are implied by this concept? And of course, professional learning communities uh, produce improved teaching, but what specific teaching practices are we actually talking about? What do we think the kinds of teaching, what kinds of teaching practices do we expect to result from these professional learning community structures and processes? And finally, what specific learning outcomes do we expect to produce? So how do we actually get this specificity? I think a good way to build a logic model and specify it is to engage in the process of backward mapping. So you have a blank slate here. I, I have nothing specific in the diagram I have up in front of you on my slide. But if I started on the right-hand side with student learning, I might ask, what specific learning outcomes am I trying to achieve? And I'm not talking about scores on an achievement test. I'm talking about scores perhaps on particular items of an achievement test in some particular domain. I'm asking what it is you expect exactly students should know and be able to do as a result of the improvement effort. That's the kind of specificity we want. And then I'm going to ask what specific instructional practices do you think consistently produce those desired learning outcomes? What, not good teaching, what practices are you thinking about that are shown or you are speculating will affect those specific learning practices? And then what exactly goes on in professional learning communities that produces those practices? How often? Do the teachers have to meet? In what settings? Who would the participants be? What do they talk about? Using what uh, discourse practices and processes? We need to specify how it is. What, what uh, problems would a professional learning community take up? Would they be looking at student work? Would they be looking at other teachers' lesson plans? Uh, as they did that, what discourse practices? You see, we need to really specify what it is we expect to observe going on in professional learning communities that's produce, that has some expectation of producing the kinds of teaching practices that we wish to observe. And finally, we have to step back and say, well, if that's the, the kind of professional learning community that we wish to observe, what steps does a developer need to take explicitly to promote these structures and processes? Who is going to meet with school personnel to provide their learning? Is the learning going to be remote or in person? Is it going to be coaching? Is it going to be frequent or infrequent? Is it going to involve follow-up or not? Are participants going to be provided with guidebooks or not? Uh, what resources are they going to be provided with? These things need to be specified in detail for us to develop a good logic model. So again, you know, where do I come up with the ideas to specify this? A good logic model can be grounded both in research and in practice. Certainly existing research will provide us with some ideas about the key features that we expect uh, uh, that will produce the kinds of teaching activities we want. And research on teaching might even provide us with some 
uh, good ideas about the particular kinds of teaching strategies that have been found to lead to our desired learning outcomes. But we can also go look at existing interventions and existing practices. And, you know, it could well be that there are particular intervention programs that have already tried to do something similar to what we're going to try to do. And we can look at the specific ways in which these developers have made change, the specific steps that they have uh, done. Or we could go into schools where we think the practices are particularly strong, and we could examine in detail what exactly is going on in those settings. So because program effectiveness research lies between pure basic and pure applied, we can borrow ideas from both to develop our logic model. Now, the point of program effectiveness research is in fact that the logic model is functioning much like basic research uses a theory. That is, as a program effectiveness researcher, we're trying to help program developers create, refine, and validate a logic model. So this logic model, as we've seen, has what outcomes, it has the implementation model, it has the service delivery model, and it does more than simply describe, it also has some causal hypotheses embedded in it. And it's those causal hypotheses that we wish to test. The hypotheses are that if I use this program delivery model, I will get certain implementation outcomes. And if I get certain implementation outcomes, I will get certain student learning outcomes. So what I want to do now is shift from talking about the logic model to thinking about the logical framework that program effectiveness researchers use to examine the confirmation status of that logic model, that is, whether that logic model is working as we expect or not. And that brings us to the potential outcomes framework for causal analysis. Now, uh, I expect as we embark on this little section of the lecture that uh, some of you will find I'm moving through this too quickly, but I, or that it may be too arcane perhaps for you, but the potential outcomes framework is a very, very important concept in modern social science research and in all fields which are attempting to become evidence-based. So, uh, and it's often just rushed over by people. It's assumed that you buy into the potential logics, uh, potential outcomes framework. And so we don't really discuss it as a logical foundation. We just assume you buy the paradigm. But what is this paradigm? Uh, let's look at it explicitly now. So we understand the commitment uh, to causal analysis. So the potential outcomes framework uh, attempts to resolve these problems I was earlier talking about uh, in correlational studies. The fact that observed correlations often don't tell you about causal ordering, don't address that issue very well, and the fact that correlations can often be spurious. What the potential outcomes framework does is provide a way to address these problems. And because it does, it's become the preferred logical foundation for making causal inferences about program effectiveness research in the research community and in the policy community. And so uh, given that, I wanna discuss the framework briefly. Now here is the basic model. And it begins with an imaginary scenario for a single unit of treatment, a person, a school. Imagine a world in which we were able to administer some treatment, let us denote that by the letter T in a school, where the treatment in our example seeks to improve the strength of a school's professional learning community. So, 
will let T indicate that the school received that treatment and will denote with the letter C that the school didn't receive that treatment. Now imagine a world in which we compare the levels of student achievement at a given school when it did and didn't receive treatment. In this setup, any given school denoted I has two potential outcomes where Y denotes the outcome, the level of outcome. It has one outcome that would occur if the school were treated and another outcome that would occur if the school was not treated. And in this setup, the causal effect of the treatment, which I am going to denote here with the Greek letter tau, for a given school is simply the difference in potential outcomes between being treated and not treated. So it's a very simple definition and a comparative one. The definition of a, of a causal effect is the difference in potential outcomes under treatment versus not treatment. That's the potential outcomes framework. Notice not a correlation. It's a difference in outcomes or potential outcomes under treatment versus not treatment. Now it turns out that this imaginary uh, example of the potential outcomes has a fundamental problem. We can never observe the same school or the same individual in treated and untreated conditions at exactly the same point in time. We can observe them being treated, we can observe them being untreated, but they can't be treated and untreated at the same time. And so we can't really ever estimate the difference between treatment and untreatment at the same time, because you can only be in one condition at a time. So we have what the potential outcomes uh, uh, advocates call a missing data problem. We can only observe the outcome in treatment for an individual or not in treatment, but not both at the same time. But there is a way around this problem, and that is, Instead of looking at the same individual or the same school in treated and untreated status at the same time, we can compare groups of schools or groups of individuals, some of which were treated and some of which were not treated. And under this procedure, we can now define the treatment effect tau as an average treatment effect where the average treatment effect how average is the expected value of y in the treatment group minus or the mean of the outcome for the treatment group minus the mean of the outcome for the control group. And that's the average treatment effect. And what we have now are groups of treated and untreated schools. And that's how we're going to arrive at our estimate of the treatment effect. So now turns out that we have two groups of schools, treated and untreated. We need to make certain assumptions about uh, in order for us to clearly identify tau average or in order for us to believe that the observed difference in treatment and control outcomes in a given study is actually the true causal effect that we would have gotten had we been able to observe the same unit in both treatment and control conditions. So what are the assumptions of, uh, that are required for us to really trust our estimate of tau average? One is called the independence assumption. It's that the assignment of units to treatment and control was independent of potential outcomes. What this is going to do is handle the problem of spuriousness for us, and I will spend some time talking to you about it. Another is maybe obvious to you, but as you will see as we go on, requires some thought. That's called the hidden variation assumption. And this is an assumption that the treatment conditions 
were the same for all units assigned to treatment. That is, we're only studying the causal effect of a single treatment. It's well-defined and it was uniformly given to all participants in T. And a final assumption is called the interference assumption. It's that receipt of treatment by any one unit does not affect the outcomes of any other unit. So now I'm gonna spend some time discussing these fundamental assumptions. The most important is the independence assumption. So if we're gonna really use groups and subtract the outcomes of the control group from the outcomes of the treatment group to get the treatment effect, we need to assure ourselves that the two groups are roughly equivalent in terms of factors which cause the outcome. And the way we do that is to make sure that assignment to treatment is not associated with any variable associated with the outcome of interest. Okay, and to see why this is the case, just consider the following thing. There could be some variable, let's name it variable X. And that variable is known to affect the outcome. And suppose somehow we use the procedure for assigning units to treatment and control that selects on X so that anybody who has a higher X, this value that causes the outcome is assigned to treatment and anybody with a lower X is assigned to control. If that's going on, then our estimate of tau average, our simple subtraction of the treatment average from the control average will be biased because it will include not only whatever treatment effect was going on, but also the effect on the outcome produced by X, which would be expected to be higher in the treatment group than the control group. So even if the treatment had absolutely no control, the fact that everybody with a high X, which caused Y was in the treatment group, would produce higher outcomes in the treatment group. We can't have that. We need some way to get around that. So let's just, again, consider how this might work in some professional learning community uh, study. Suppose we're studying an intervention to increase uh, professional learning communities. So we wanna estimate the causal effect of that intervention on student achievement. Now, suppose further that when we go to assign schools to treatment and control, the ones that had higher quality teachers who produce higher achievement are all assigned to treatment, to treatment schools, and the ones with the lower quality schools, the ones that produce lower achievement, are all assigned to the control schools. So at pretreatment, there are actually systematic differences in teacher quality across schools in treatment and control. Then at the end of the study period, even if the PLC intervention has no effect, we should expect that the schools assigned to treatment will have a higher score than the schools assigned to the control group. And that means that when we go to estimate tau average simply by subtracting treatment scores, uh, control scores from treatment scores, we are going to not only identify whatever causal effect is in there, but we'll also be identifying an effect of the difference among schools in uh, quality of teachers. And we don't want that. We're trying to identify purely the effect of the treatment, not the effect of conditions other than the treatment that are affecting the outcome. So how do we assure ourselves that the independence assumption is met in a given study? It turns out that the really only trustworthy, fully trustworthy way to do this is through random assignment of units to treatment or control. If the assignment mechanism used in a study, random assignment, assigns T or C randomly, then any potential X that might affect Y will be distributed evenly in expectation across the two groups. 
And as a result, X can still be affecting the outcome, but it doesn't affect assignment. So there can be no spurious correlation in the data because the X's are all even in treatment and control when we subtract the control group scores on average from the treatment group scores, we are going to be able to identify the true treatment effect. And you can in fact check this assumption against the data. If random assignment is working properly, which it will do if you have a large enough sample size, there'll be no difference in pretreatment covariates in Xs, any X you might name between the treatment and the control samples. The two samples will be equivalent on pretreatment covariates, both observed and unobserved. If we're not making random assignment, then we're in some trouble. But what I am going to discuss <clears throat> next lecture is how we can actually make a lesser assumption, which is often made in quasi-experiments, that conditional on some known X or set of Xs, assignment to treatment or control is independent of outcomes. And this is akin to, in the statistical world, controlling for X in calculating the correlation, or in our case, calculating tau average, or partialing out the effect of X's. And as I said, I'm going to discuss how that can be done uh, in quasi-experimental settings in my next lecture. But for now, I want to emphasize the importance of random assignment as the single most trustworthy way of assuring that this independence assumption has been met and meeting the independence assumption is what we really need to do in order for us to use tau average as the estimate of a causal effect. Now let's go to the hidden variations assumption. So we let's suppose that we've assured ourselves either because we've randomly assigned units or we've done some check that the units in treatment and control have the same distribution of observed and unobserved Xs that might affect outcomes, then we have to satisfy the hidden variations assumption. This simply holds that all subjects assigned to treatment are experiencing the same intervention. And this is where the logic model comes in. In practice, this means that we've actually worked very hard to develop a well-defined treatment and that we have only one version of that treatment that we are testing in our attempt to estimate the causal impact. Put in the terms of the logic model, uh, this would mean the service delivery model for the intervention was the same for all units receiving treatment. So you can do experiments in which there are two versions of the service delivery model, but then in fact, what we have are two alternative treatments and we need to estimate two alternative treatment effects. So the hidden variations assumption simply says, look, at any given time, we're only gonna study one treatment or at any given time, we can only confidently estimate the, the, what we can only confidently use tau average if the, there's one treatment. If there's two treatments going on, we need to disentangle them to get a good tau average. And the final is the interference assumption. And so supposing we've done a study and we've assured ourselves that we met the independence assumption. The treatment and control groups have the same distribution on pretreatment Xs uh, that might affect outcomes, and we only are studying a single treatment then uh, we have to assure ourselves that there's no interference in the study. Here's an example of interference. It's kind of a humble example, uh, everyday example, but imagine a world in which Mr. and Mrs. Smith both are participating in a weight loss intervention study in which the treatment is preparation and consumption of healthy meals, which is expected to create weight loss. By chance, Mrs. Smith, who does the cooking in the family, gets assigned to the treatment group. 
and she's a good subject and faithfully prepares healthy meals. And these are consumed by her and also her husband, who by chance has been assigned to the control group. Then under this scenario, Mr. Smith loses weight, not because he was in the control group, but because Mrs. Smith's assignment to the treatment group affected his potential outcomes. Okay, there are many ways in which uh, this kind of interference goes on in studies. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you can imagine if I am operating within schools and I give an intervention to some of the, some of the students, the fact that that intervention might work might have an effect also on other students in the classroom who benefit from having a smarter student sitting with them and helping with them. So we, we don't want that kind of interference going on in our studies. And so the usual way this is handled in education research and actually in uh, lots of social research is to make sure that if we are assigning treatments where we think there could be interference, we assign treatment at the group level, not the person level. So we don't try to treat different students who interact with each other in the same school. We don't try to assign those students one to treatment, the other to control. What we do is we assign the school to treatment at another school to control. And that's how we handle the interference assumption. And that raises a bunch of statistical problems that uh, get covered under the term cluster randomized uh, field trials. And uh, I, I will talk a little bit about that uh, at later points in this lecture series. So I hope you're accumulating some questions. If you're not, uh, we're going to move here pretty shortly to a questions period. But let me just summarize uh, uh, what I have said in the first part of this lecture. I've been talking about key shifts in research design that are made by program effectiveness researchers. And so what are these shifts? We're moving from studying naturally occurring variation observed in the real world to studying deliberate efforts to change the real world. We're moving from examining the confirmation status of abstract theories to examining the confirmation status of program logic models. And we're moving from associationist or correlational modes of analysis to the potential outcomes framework for causal analysis. So how does this work in the kinds of research you're likely to encounter? In general approach to research, we are, now we're, I'm at the table, moving away from studying the world as it is and finding instances of natural variation in X and studying how it's associated with Y to developing interventions that actually create X and examining the causal effects on Y after we've applied the intervention. For hypotheses, we're moving away from testing abstract theories. We're building up a logic model to be sure we can use abstract theory and um, practical experience to build that logic model. But it's the causal hypotheses inside the logic model that we're attempting to test. When we try to figure out whether a program is having an effect, we're moving away from associational kinds of statistics that look at the correlation of X and Y, even regression coefficients that represent that correlation, to trying to calculate a simple difference in outcomes across treatment and control groups. But we admit that there can always be confounding in the data, this spurious correlation problem. And what we're trying to do in program effectiveness research is move away from relying on statistical controls to uh, achieve 
that uh, disconfounding to random assignment of treatment, to random assignment to units in treatment and control to meet the independence assumption and assure us that there's no selection confounding spuriousness in our findings. We're moving away from observing real world phenomena that often have ambiguous uh, interpretations to looking at the effects of very clearly defined treatments, service delivery packages defined by a logic model and applied to a treatment group. And we're always attentive to uh, interference, uh, but the beauty of the uh, experimental paradigm is we can take the interference into account at the point of assignment to treatment, not have to adjust it post hope. Again, uh, just to, to show you and to say it one more time, this time in the context of, for example, research on professional learning communities, we're no longer going to go out and observe the world as it is, finding instances of natural variation in professional learning community strength. We're going to build up interventions that we intend to use to create strong professional learning communities. We're not going to rely exclusively on abstract theory to create hypotheses to test. We're going to instead test the embedded causal hypotheses in our logic model, which as we've seen is built up from abstract theory and from prior research and from practical attempts. We're no longer going to engage in as best we can research that estimates the association between PLC strengths and student achievement, we're gonna to try to conduct studies where schools are assigned to a treatment or a control, and we're gonna calculate the difference in outcomes across these groups as our effect. We're no longer gonna have ambiguous causal ordering. We're gonna estimate the effect of our treatment after the treatment is applied. We're not going to use statistical controls in our models when we estimate the effect, although I will discuss occasions in which we will. But the, the notion that we have identified the, the uh, unbiased association between professional learning communities and PLCs in a standard regression analysis are very, very difficult. If you, if you don't believe me, go read what the assumptions are of a, of a correctly specified uh, regression model. Uh, instead, what we're gonna do to try to get rid of confounding and identify an unbiased effect size is randomly assign troll schools to treatment and control. Our treatment is no longer ambiguously defined. It's difficult to know what was measured in these correlational studies of uh, professional learning communities. There were often many different uh, dimensions being measured at the same time, and these dimensions weren't exactly highly correlated. And so it was difficult to know what a real strong learning community looks like. We get an idea, but not, not a clear definition in the program effectiveness literature, the treatment is defined as a well-specified service delivery model. So we know what the treatment is and the treatment is what, what we are using to create the intermediate and final outcomes. And finally, we are using uh, the, these, this interference issue is probably not worth discussing here. So one final look. And then I'm gonna take questions. What I've been arguing for now, uh, probably more than an hour, is the program effectiveness research is a form of use-inspired research, but it proceeds somewhat differently from pure basic research and pure applied research. And in doing so, it has some fundamental commitments. 
move away from studying natural variation to studying plan change. Test a well-developed logic model of intervention, not an abstract theory, and shift away from associationist statistics to the use of the potential outcomes uh, framework for causal analysis. So that uh, concludes the first portion of uh, this. And what I am going to do is now uh, go to the question and answer box. Uh, and I see that we have so far 17 opened questions, two of which say, can we get the materials? Yes. And the recording is uh, of the lecture will be, I think, available for download. But here's a substantive question. Is it possible to evaluate a program's effectiveness after it has begun? So the answer to that is yes. It is possible to use quasi-experimental designs to evaluate a program's effectiveness once the program is in operation. And I will discuss this in uh, some detail in my next lecture. It would not be possible ordinarily to study program effectiveness with random assignment designs before the program has been done, however. And so uh, if you're, you, you know, when a program has already been done, the main issue is whether or not we, we, we have a set of treatment schools defined, we have to know what the mechanism was that assigned schools to treatment, we create and then we are in quasi experiments going to create a control group and use certain matching strategies uh, or other strategies to assure ourselves that the treatment and control group are equivalent on all pretreatment covariates. So the answer to that is yes, it's possible to study post hoc the effectiveness of programs. That's often done. But as you will see, that's off. That's generally almost never done with random assignment. Random assignment plans the study prior to the launch. So that's the answer to that question by John Stiles. An anonymous uh, attendee asks, are potential outcomes synonymous to counterfactuals? Uh, and the answer to that depends on uh, what world you come from. The, 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 the study of causality is studied by philosophers and by statisticians. But in general, yes, the potential outcomes can be seen as counterfactuals. For example, when I assign an individual to treatment, I, um, what I want to do is imagine the counterfactual against which I am going to estimate the causal effect. That's the control condition. And I want to specify what that is. That's a specification. So yes, and in fact, um, in my next lecture, you'll notice that I've stopped talking about uh, the potential outcomes framework. And I'm talking about ways to create uh, research designs that have counterfactuals, by which I mean there is a treatment condition and there is some control condition. And in this game, what we are imagining is the people who are assigned to treatment, what would be those people's uh, outcomes, potential outcomes under the counterfactual, which is treatment. And we have some people assigned to treatment, and we have to imagine what their outcomes would be under the counterfactual of no treatment or control. So yeah, they're basically uh, basically uh, synonymous now, you know, uh, I say that with a caution, and if you really want to get deeply into it and get picky about words, 
you know, you, you, you can read philosophy, which is uh, something I sometimes do and always come away confused. So I, I guess my answer is yes. For all intents and purposes, counterfactuals and potential outcomes are roughly expressing the same idea. Uh, the next question is making my point. It is from, uh, I hope you're reading along. It says, could it be that pure basic research and practical applied research can be combined in a particular study? And so the notion is uh, that, I mean, in some sense, uh, in some sense, that is what program effectiveness researchers uh, are trying to do uh, if they have sufficient funding to do so. Let me just take a moment and give you an example of this uh, from my own work. And it might be abstract, but I will, I will sort of tell you uh, my experience trying to do this because I try to sit between uh, a, a world in which my colleagues are interested in the advancement of disciplinary theory, and I am interested in talking to people in practice. So I was once commissioned to do a study of several different uh, intervention programs that were operating in the United States. And one of these programs was highly specified. It was called Success for All. And it, it, it ended up really having teachers implement very well specified routines. And it was kind of a classical form of the routinized technology of instruction. And another of these interventions thought, well, you know, we really shouldn't routinize instruction. It's a very complex and uncertain task. What we should do is have teachers form into professional learning communities to uh, study problems of instruction and try to make their teaching better. So I had two different types of interventions that I was studying at the same time in comparison to a control group. And for me, as a matter of basic research, this was testing a fundamental hypothesis from organization theory. So now let me step back to that. The basic idea in organization theory, a very fundamental hypothesis is when a task is uncertain, it is best managed with these forms of, or, of organic management of the sort that was be being done in a professional learning community. No hierarchy, collegial solutions to problems of uncertainty. On the other hand, when a task is highly certain, it can be highly routinized and then it will be more effective. So instruction can't really be both highly routinized or highly uncertain at the same time. And what I wanted to do was see these instances of concrete interventions from the real world and see which one was working to see what we could learn about the nature of instruction as a technology and how it is best managed. So yes, you can contribute at the same time by looking closely at practice, at practical interventions, but you can use your findings from those intervention studies if you have enough money and to mount the kind of study we did to contribute to basic research. So uh, uh, to that question, I would answer yes, but it's difficult. Um, how different is the tech? This is the next question, which is how different is the technique that I am describing in the potential outcomes framework from the difference in difference analysis? And um, do we still need to be bothered by, I will discuss this in some detail in my next lecture. I would argue that the difference in difference technique, which rely, relies on a particular assumption uh, that uh, relies on a particular assumption about um, constant 
uh, rates prior to the intervention among the two groups being compared. And uh, the, they deliberately, uh, I'll show you how that equates to their attempt in asserting that the rates of change prior to intervention were same, equates to uh, the, uh, or is used by them to satisfy the independence assumption. But the difference in difference uh, strategists are very aware of the uh, potential outcomes framework and are solving it in their own particular way. And I will talk about the difference in different strategies in uh, uh, not the next lecture, but well, maybe the next lecture. And, and okay, so what is, uh, now the next question here is what is the difference between the logic model and a program evaluation model? Well, I'm not certain what a program evaluation model is. I'm only certain what a logic model is. And so uh, a program evaluation model could be a model of how I was going to do the program evaluation, whereas a logic model, or maybe the, the, the person who uses that term is using it interchangeably. But the logic model is a theory very explicit about how the intervention is expected to operate when it is operating, okay? That, that's what a logic model is. So the next uh, is, does the logic model always assume a straightforward relationship from input to output to outcome? And how could we account for factors causing spuriousness in the logic model? And will that model still be linear or are we now expecting a web-like logical framework? Um, you know, that's a, that's, a difficult, uh, that's a difficult question. So as I have formulated it, uh, my logic model is actually fairly simple and straightforward. I don't know if uh, it's linear in form, but it's certainly sequential in form and the way I stretched it out doesn't have a lot of uncertainty in it. If you go to uh, the coda of my lecture, which at this point I'm not certain I have much time to get to, you will see that a logic model is something that needs to be tested and may be wrong. And if it is, if there are, for example, lots of uncertainties in the model such that there are many different uh, paths between uh, uh, input and outcome, or there's error terms in those models, that those generally work to uh, they can work in several ways. One way they can work is to deflate the ultimate comparison between what happened to people we applied treatment to and was the outcome good. They'll be in, in a sort of lots of uncertainty in how the logic model works could end up meaning that the average causal effect is zero. Now, it could be also that there could be certain conditions under which the logic model works and some conditions under which it doesn't work. Those are things that one wants to figure out in sort of mediational analyses or at the development stage. So um, it's a complex uh, question. It's it deserves study and what I sh show you in the coda is how you go from design experiments to gateway studies to uh, uh, big randomized field trials. And at each step, you should be exploring these kind of contingencies that are being asked for here. Okay, I'm now using, how can we use random assignment to class levels at school? 
classes are already formed and even random assigned subjects may get unknown age that may impact the outcome. Can you elaborate? Okay, so um, you have naturally formed classroom groups, but those groups as wholes can be randomly assigned to treatment. And to the extent that you're, you have available to you enough classrooms to assign to treatment and control, even if those classes are ability grouped or something like that, and so are very different in form, if you're using random assignment to, uh, as, the, as the assignment mechanism, you're using random assignment, the differences in classrooms across treatment and control will be washed out. And so you can confidently estimate tau average by randomly assigning classes. Uh, okay, so now the, the, the uh, question about um, unknown aids that might impact the outcome in general, the idea is if you, you, you have to rule that out. You, you, can't, you have to rule out that the tr that's part of the no hidden variations assumption. You have to rule out that either the treatment or the control group is not receiving something that is impacting their outcomes systematically. And uh, I can show you some ways in which, and we'll talk about this in, in experimental designs that we try to do this. So one is random assignment of intact groups to treatment and control will handle uh, the independence assumption. And uh, the, it, the interference assumption is, uh, is something that you uh, need to be aware of uh, if you think, for example, randomly assigning classrooms within the same school to treatment and control might involve some interference, then you probably want to assign schools to the treatment and control group, not classrooms within schools. And uh, that gets rid of interference. And this hidden age thing, I don't know if that's, that, that could be a violation of the hidden variations assumption. So that's my understanding of that question. And uh, let's go to this next question. If in constructing the logic model, we want to combine both evidence from the real world and research findings, what's, the, what's a good practice? Well, um, I mean, just, I don't have a good practice. I, I, I think that the point I wish to emphasize is that the proof of the pudding that a logic model works is not in its construction. It's in the testing of the model at the pilot stage, at the gateway stage, and at the RCT uh, stage. And so, I don't have a explicit answer to the good practice so other than these are the good practices of logical reasoning and making good guesses and following the evidence where it leads, but you always want to test your logic model. A logic model is always being tested. Now, uh, so that's my answer to that one. So the next question is related to this. It's, um, is there, are there certain norms to follow or can we make our own model? I guess now that people are asking me for models of how to make a logic model, um, there's advice from people who make logic models to people about how to make logic models. And, um, I don't have, I see this as a craft, not a science. If you get the distinction, the, some people are good at making these models and maybe they can help you make good models too. Uh, so 
I would recommend for anybody who wants to think more about logic models and how to develop them, the craft of doing that, just go to Google and type in how to create a logic model. And I guarantee you, you will find lots of information. And then I'll leave it to you to assess the quality and utility of that information to you. I didn't include any single source about how to make a logic model because I see it more as a, as a, as a creative act. But I, I will say that, um, you know, a logic model that defies existing findings from scientific research is probably not a good logic model, nor is one that defies the practical wisdom of, of, uh, of practice. And so, you know, for example, I could create a logic model in which I said, any given student needs 80 hours of supplemental instruction a week, in addition to the time they spend in school for this intervention to work. I mean, right, logically, that doesn't make any sense at all. So you get my point, you, you, you know, your logic model, if you plan on intervening, it ought to be able to uh, fit into the practical constraints or be able to change the practical constraints that people in practice really face. And, you know, it probably should not defy or be inconsistent with uh, what we've already found. Uh, uh, this, there's a question that says, can you recommend similar studies that employed the models you've discussed quantitatively? Any experiment is using the potential outcomes framework. Um, and so, uh, you know, read any experiment and you will see somebody using the potential outcomes. So if you, if you wanna, uh, you know, they're, they're just, thousands of experiments around and those are actual studies employing the potential outcomes framework so i recommend you read those and you'll if if you want to read a study that's an experiment um just go look for an experiment okay the next question is is it necessary that a research study goes beyond correlation of variables by examining how a variable manipulates one or manipulates another and the effects it will cause when the intention of the researcher is just to confirm that there is a correlation. Yeah, so uh, this is an excellent question and I thank the uh, questioner for asking this. There, it is not the case that program effectiveness research is the only kind of research to be done in the world. In fact, correlations among variables can be important descriptive information about the way the world works. We deal with these and find these important all the time. For example, I don't know if you are like me, but I expect that you are. The correlation between students' income level and their achievement is profoundly disturbing to me. And whether or not that correlation varies across certain settings is important descriptive information for me. I'd like to find settings where that correlation is less strong than it is in the United States. I'd like to look at those countries. I would like to describe them and think about them. But, and I find that work fascinating. I am a sociologist, I do this all the time. So this is not, I'm not an advocating for program effectiveness research saying it's the only kind of research to do. All I'm telling you is if you look at that correlation between poverty and achievement and want to intervene on the situation, now 
you've become you've moved yourself over into my world and you need uh, many people in my world you will find are thinking about the world in the way I describe. So, uh, okay, I, I make no claims that this is the program effectiveness research, studying interventions, moving away from correlational analysis, uh, using the uh, a potential outcomes framework is the only way to do research. And if you're not doing that, you're not a real researcher. I don't say that. I love research. I like all kinds of research. But program effectiveness researchers are asking questions that tend to have a particular form of research associated with it. And that's what I am describing. So that's my answer. It's a great question. Now I'll go to the question. In a program where random allocation of treatment was not designed from the beginning, how should we approach the evaluation of program effectiveness? Is it even possible? Stay tuned for next lecture because we'll begin to talk about that, okay? Yes, it is possible. And there are many designs, but the only, the, the, all I'm gonna say here today, you know, there's a big literature on quasi experiments and, and there are different ways of making causal inferences. But the single most powerful one that satisfies the independence assumption is random assignment. Short of random assignment, we're making assumptions and uh, we have to show that our assumptions are true and often we can't and so we're left with assumptions. But yeah, plenty of program evaluations. In fact, I would say most program evaluations aren't using random assignment. Uh, I would recommend that more do, but there are many quasi experimental research designs that I will talk about um, in, the, in, in my next lecture. So thanks for answering that. In real world research, how do you handle ethical issues around in assigning an entire school as a control and not receiving any treatment? So um, there are a couple of ways that I think about that problem. The first is as a researcher, when I am evaluating a program, I do not know for a fact that it is any better than doing business as usual. So in that situation, I don't see that uh, an ethical issue in my withholding a valuable treatment from the control group. The ethical issue actually that I worry about is that somehow the treatment might have a negative effect on those assigned to treatment. So, so you see, I mean, when you start with the presumption that I don't know if it works, then I'm not really ethically starting from the premise that some of you with, are being withheld from, a, from a, a, a useful good. And I'm actually trying to do no harm in my experimentation. Now, what happens if I find out that, that the intervention does work and is useful? The usual way we handle this in practice is to promise some point of conversion at which if it works, we will incentivize you uh, uh, by uh, offsetting your costs to join the treatment. That, that's generally how we handle it. But, but again, um, I think that the, 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 this is a, to me an endlessly fascinating question um, because many times I find in the world of practice, people have the following situation. We have a problem. It's a pressing problem. We have to do something about it. Let's go find a program that says it's doing something about it and let's give it to everybody. Okay, so when you do that, if you know that the program works because there's a substantial body of evidence demonstrating that it works and that it works for schools like your kind of school, 
then good, adopt it. But if the program is uncertain, if its a effectiveness is uncertain and not established, wouldn't it be better practice to uh, withhold treatment to everybody and find out if it works in your setting? I'm trying to change the mentality because the I, I have seen so many people in practice rush to adoption of programs because they feel like they have to do something. But in the long run, if they found out through more careful study whether that program works in their context, they might be better off. And so that's also an ethical issue. So let me review. If you think the program has no established evidence of efficacy, I see no ethical, I, I, you know, I just don't see an ethical issue in trying it out in some schools and not others, because I'm not withholding some known good from anybody. The ethical problem I see is if I give this treatment in treatment schools, I might harm somebody. So I'm very careful about that. But let's say we find it works. Well, then at some point at the end of the study, I will give you an incentive. I'll offset your costs partially for adoption because of your contribution to the knowledge base. Okay. And then uh, if it, what I would like to see in the world of practice is more openness to experimentation because I think that there is a tendency to try things, but not, but to try them without any possibility of learning from the, from the practice by trying them everywhere, not in some schools compared to others. So that's my answer to uh, that. The question, the next question is, what are the limitations of the random assignment design? The main limit, the main limit is that uh, sometimes random, random assignment only works especially confidently with, you know, it operates according to the law of large numbers. So sample size, you need sufficient sample size to assure yourselves that in expectation, random sampling has actually distributed the X's uh, in ways that are no longer associated with outcomes. So that, it, you know, it generally requires a fairly uh, large sample size to be operating properly. Uh, random assignment, it, you know, I mean, that, that would be the one limitation that I would see to it, not the one theoretical limitation to the random assignment design. Perhaps some others can think of something, but that, that's really the main one, the law of large numbers. Um, the next question is, after we use random assignment, should we measure the teacher quality just to make sure for unbiased? Okay, so yes, uh -huh. I, 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 I will talk about this in reporting. Because random assignment only works in expectation and is a chance process, there is a possibility that the sample of treatment and control schools will be unbalanced in some particular way. And any good study shows, uh, shows evidence that the samples of treatment and control schools are equivalent on a wide range of observed variables known to be correlated to the outcome. Okay, yeah, so the answer to that is yes. You should, you should, if you have uh, hypotheses, strong hypotheses about what variables could be affecting the outcome in your study, and you want to convince the reader that the independence assumption has been met, measure those variables and show the table that shows that the independence assumption has been met. And if you show that it has been met on these measurables, then I become a little more confident that it's been met on unmeasured variables as well. But that is an excellent question. And I will talk about this in the, in the lecture on reporting. This is something people who do studies of random assignment should report. So that's an excellent question. And the answer is yes. Uh,
Okay, so this question has a lot of elements to it and um, uh, is really about research design. And my recommendation is that if you attend the lecture next time, um, we will talk quite a bit about every one of the issues mentioned in this uh, uh, question. And so I, I, I'm not gonna take this up now, uh, Christian, just hang with me until the next lecture. We're gonna get to that. And I think I can, I think, I think I can help you with that. This says, supposing I wanna find a way to improve the logical reasoning of students in a school, can I use program effectiveness research? I see no reason why not. I mean, uh, it does seem like you can do that. And all you have to do is tell me or for yourself, uh, figure out how you think you could do that and then engage in some research to demonstrate whether or not your theory of doing that actually works in practice. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see any issue there. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Have we, we've gone over the two hour mark, I think. So I'm gonna take a few more of these questions. Ah, so this question asks, how do we use these concepts to implement a whole, uh, something where we're doing a whole school? Uh, and so the answer, and so this, do we use, do we assign two schools to uh, treatment and two to control, for example? So the YIT, in this case, the I will be indexing the school as the unit of assignment, okay? And the difference in achievement is the difference in achievement of across the averages of each school. Okay, so yeah, the answer is you've got that right. We are assigning whole schools to either the treatment or the control group, and then looking at student outcomes on average across these schools. And there's complex clustering involved here and we can talk about that. But yes, the answer is that, that a PLC experiment would almost certainly be uh, assigning schools as the unit of treatment. Uh, and so, yeah, that can be done. Let's see. Okay, so uh, th this, here's a question that has two points to it. The first is that this person does think that randomization of uh, random assignment of schools to treatments probably is doable, but thinks that it might be very difficult to randomly assign students within schools. Let me just take that as the first question. So, it is not impossible to assign students within schools randomly to treatment and control in principle. I mean, you know, maybe maybe somebody's gonna sort of not like that in the school, like, hey, how come my kid is getting it and your kid isn't? But it, it, you can do this and this is done. Random assignment within school to treatment and control is done, it does raise an interference problem, but it, 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 it is in principle doable. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it and uh, I'll let you figure out, uh, you know, but in principle, it, it is doable. The next question says, um, let's suppose I want to study a kid phenomena within schools that have not been where the, where the school has been randomly assigned, but the kids have not, but I have data on the kids. Can I use correlation or regression to perform some kinds of randomization? Well, no, you can't randomize through post hoc analysis, but you certainly can study, uh, you can certainly use correlation and regression in a in a in a, 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 a for relationships among variables among kids inside of a, a group level random assignment 
study. But you know, you're not studying a randomly assigned treatment when you're doing that. You're just looking at uh, phenomena of, at COVID, of correlations among variables across treatment and control or within treatment and control. So uh, my answer is yes, but but don't think that you're doing causal analysis. The causal and if the treatment is assigned at the school level. The causal analysis is about differences in treatment effects between treatment and control. And, uh, you know, that's where randomization occurred, and that's the level at which the treatment effect is going to be estimated. You can control for covariates among the kids in your models and so on. And we, I guess, I'm going to have to spend some time in lecture three which is about how to estimate treatment effects. I, I, what this set of questions suggests to me is I need to spend some time uh, showing you the logic of cluster randomized experiments and the kinds of analyses. So uh, thank you for that question. That's an anonymous attendee. Now I'm going to the question in examining the causal effect how do we develop the instrument that we can ensure we're measuring the desired outcome? Well, okay, so uh, as we will see, or as has been explained in the famous Campbell and Stanley book, the original book on quasi-experiments, it's certainly true that the estimate of tau average is not an estimate in the true outcomes of people, it's, a, it's an estimate of the measured outcomes of people. And so, you know, we would like that measure to be both valid and reliable. And, uh, you know, we want uh, validity because we don't want any construct slip and we want reliability because it makes it more, our estimate a bit more precise. So, how to develop a good measure is a topic of a whole field called psychometrics and is not going to be a topic that I'm going to discuss much here. I might incorporate the notion of measurement error into some of my discussions about uh, design and uh, reporting and so on, but, but uh, this lecture series won't get into those measurement issues, but measurement issues are important and it's a good question. And the answer is generally found in the field of psychometrics. So here, the next question is seemingly at first a comment that says, I think it's very difficult to measure the effectiveness of a treatment between two groups. Numerous variables that aren't constant, variables might have an impact on the treatment, uh, difficult to ensure teachers in both groups. How should we address the issue? Well, the issue, the that's what this course is about, so, or this lecture series. So um, almost certainly schools differ on a lot of both observed and unobserved characteristics. And so when we apply a treatment and try to estimate the difference, you know, the effect using the potential outcomes framework, we have this problem, well, geez, these schools are all different. The beauty of random assignment is that in expectation, that is with a large enough sample, we, we, we rule out that any of these potential factors affecting outcomes have been distributed disproportionately to the treatment and control group. They are now distributed quite evenly among treatment and control because of random assignment. And now our simple difference in scores identifies a true causal effect. That's the beauty of the potential outcomes independence assumption. In practice, without random assignment, the independence assumption is not met. And that is so, and much of social science research is about how to identify a causal effect when the independence assumption is not confidently met by random assignment. 
And that is the question we will take up next week. How can I design an experiment and approximate random assignment through quasi-experimental techniques, difference in differences, instrumental variables, so on and so forth. Okay, Th this is a huge area. And my lecture next time will discuss this. So that's, 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 that's my answer to that. So now here's a person who says, you know, basically, Rowan, you are a person who's interested in schools. What's the application to policy? Um, many policies that get founded uh, or implemented actually affect schools or persons. And so a policy is simply can be simply conceived as a treatment. So I have a policy that is going to give you money conditional upon your sending your child to a doctor. And I'm interested in whether that policy affects the health of your child. And so I run an experiment. Some people I give the incentive to, some people I don't. The treatment is giving the money. You see, the, 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 any policy can be thought of as a treatment. And you, know, you, you sort of have to think through the logic model of what, what does this policy give the treated or exposed unit uh, that's the service delivery model. What do I expect the receipt of these services or that policy constraint to be on intermediate outcomes and what outcome am I trying to affect? So I see policies as uh, interventions. Sometimes they're intended as interventions. Lots of policies are. And so that's, that's how this applies to that. Um, Let's see. I might have lost myself here. Oh, what are applications of program effectiveness research outside the academic community? I would say that a large number of people, I, I can speak uh, confidently about the United States. And I think by implication, countries that many of you are uh, interested in. So, you know, uh, I made an interesting transition in my life. I am in fact a trained sociologist and was trained to do basic research. And I told my mentors that I wanted to do education research. And in particular, I wanted to study interventions and they almost disowned me. And, um, so uh, I took a job outside the academy in a research organization that did applied research. And Palm Corcoran, uh, who is uh, uh, somebody you may or may not know is very associated with the project who's sponsoring this, also spent years doing that kind of work in an organization outside of uh, the academy and many foundations uh, sponsor private organizations that do this kind of work. So it's very possible in many circumstances to join a non-academic or non-governmental organization that, that does applied research. Uh, and, uh, you know, the United States has just a ton of big companies that are not for profits and for profits that do this kind of work. Lots of government agencies do this kind of research. So uh, program effectiveness research is common, not only in the academy, but outside of it. Uh, 
there's an observation here that program effectiveness research emanates from monitoring and evaluation theory of change in action research. So uh, you know, what are the, I guess I'll answer this question about the relationship of uh, program effectiveness research as I have described it to things like action research or uh, theory of change, but mostly action research. So um, action research, I think, has its own separate tradition uh, that probably uh, is potentially is more interested in observing the consequences of one's action or uh, agency in a particular setting. And the program effectiveness types are more interested in sort of generalizing across. But these terms about um, monitoring and evaluation and uh, theory of change and logic of action are quite common in lots of applied disciplines. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing a particular brand of doing applied research here. So here's a, by using the potential outcome, what's the best value for the treatment effect? It's a, it's a great question, actually, you know, like uh, how big should the treatment effect be before we think, wow, that's good. So um, there are many ways to think about the size of a treatment effect and whether or not get in and what to do once one has found that size. So uh, one interesting effect is what's the, um, is kind of a gold standard effect. So supposing we are introducing a program, that, let's take the drug example. Supposing we're introducing a new drug. And this new drug is actually 10 times less expensive than the current drug used to cure a particular medical problem. Then the effect that we might want to observe of that drug is about, we'd like that drug to have the same effectiveness as the gold standard drug. Okay, so that's one sort of thing. Or be no worse than some other more expensive drug, okay? So we can establish uh, a useful effect size in comparison to the effect of some similar intervention. And, you know, maybe it costs less to, to do, so we like it. Um, another way is to standardize the effect size in terms of standard deviations and say, well, you know, uh, this thing ought to get like a third of a standard deviation in outcome change between treatment and control. And so, you know, if you look at most interventions that work in social settings on human beings, the, the metric there is somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3, a third of a standard deviation change in the outcome. If you look at medical interventions, um, you know, uh, sometimes their effects are quite small, but, you know, uh, they're willing to have those small effects because they're trying to prevent loss. So I guess the answer is that uh, there is no single answer to the what's the best effect, you know, what's the threshold an effect needs to meet. There are lots of ways of thinking about it and, you know, it behooves the consumer of the study to uh, uh, address what the threshold value of that tau average needs to be for you to want to pay any, indifferent, any difference. There's a, what's the difference between a logic model and log frame analysis? I, I really couldn't answer that question because I don't know what log frame analysis is. Is program effectiveness the same as program impact? So if the if you read the coda and if you hang with me through this lecture series, you will see that impact on outcomes 
is one question asked by uh, program effectiveness researchers, but you know, the impact of treatment on implementation is another question that gets asked. And, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot more questions than sort of what is known as the ultimate impact study. Or put differently, the ultimate impact study uh, will raise a lot of questions other than the simple uh, difference between treatment and control on the outcome of interest. All right, let me skew. Uh, at this point, someone should advise me whether I should stop answering questions or not, because I'm pretty sure we've gone over the two hours of time allotted for this. Shall I? Let me, should I continue? Does someone want to send me a chat note? Let me just stop the question and answer. Could, could somebody uh, okay, send so Brian, me? Yes. I, I can collect all of the question to you and also you can like answer by text and also we can post your, your answer to the participants. This is okay. Well, that's difficult for me uh, because these questions, I mean, I would just assume go through, there's 40 questions now. I've got not a whole lot left. So if people are still here, I would like not to have to write the answers to questions. Okay. So maybe we can continue for the lecture too, because we still have three more lectures. Yes, that's true. Okay. That's true. Okay, so we done for today? Yes, let me just wrap by saying, uh, if you're still interested, there is a coda that describes a little bit more and this final slides send you to some references. But uh, yeah, let's conclude. And I thank you for uh, uh, really a wonderful set of questions and for your attention to my lecture. And I look forward to uh, talking to you again. So thank you.